Identifying the cause or causes of political events is one of the central tasks of comparative politics and political science more generally. Talking about cause and effect though is something that seems easy. You know, if I don't eat, that will cause me to be hungry. If I strike a match, I will start a fire. But when it comes to talking about politics, it can be very complicated. Does development cause democracy? How can we tell what causes corruption? These questions get harder the more that you think about them. So in this video lecture, I'm going to outline a technical definition of causality and focus on three things. First, separating a cause and an effect. Second, thinking about causality as eliminating alternate explanations. And last, thinking more about likely rather than absolute causes. First, I'd like to be clear about what types of questions we are talking about, factual, causal, and normative. Factual questions ask what is, like what is the difference between democracy and dictatorship? Causal questions, by contrast, ask why or how something happens, why a country becomes more democratic, or how a protest can build support. In this class, we're going to look at both of these types of questions. We're going to start each unit by defining what we mean by rule of law or corruption, for example. But our main focus is going to be on causal questions. Does economic development cause democracy? Or how does rule of law create economic growth? Combined, these two categories of questions tend to focus on what we call empirical political science where empirical means something that's based on observation. By contrast, a class on political theory actually focuses more on normative questions. These focus on what is right or wrong. Theory and morality are incredibly important, but we evaluate them using different criteria, like the logic of an argument or your personal values. I do want to offer two quick caveats before I move on. First, there is a lot of gray area here especially when we think about things like public policy. When you need to make a decision about what to do about a problem, you have to think both about what evidence there is that a proposed policy actually works, but also what we actually think is right. In addition, especially in the United States, we tend to imbue definitions of things like democracy or corruption with a moral component. So I'm not saying that you should just forget ethics or logic in this class. But what I am saying is that it's very important to be clear about the type of argument that you're making, because it is very hard to counter a factual or causal point with a normative argument, and vice versa. Last and quickly, I don't want you to get too caught up on the whole what versus why versus how thing. I might ask you to focus on why and how questions, but that just means I want you to think about causes and processes. It doesn't mean that you can't actually phrase a causal question with the word what. So just to recap, I want you to focus on knowing the difference between a factual, causal, and normative question, and also on keeping them separate. One reason we focus on causal questions in this class is that they're often really hard to answer. Take the question of whether economic development causes democracy. Even after we define our terms, there are many ways that development might actually lead to democracy. These are called intervening or contributing causes. Development might lead to a larger middle class, which starts to demand political rights that match their new economic power. Or it might empower the working class who protest in order to improve their conditions. Or we might see a relationship between development and democracy, but democracy might not actually cause development. It could be the other way around. Democracy might be the cause of economic development if it creates political institutions that promote innovation and growth. So when we think about causality, we have to identify different possible causes and whether we're really talking about a cause or an effect. This is particularly difficult in comparative politics because so many countries get caught in what we call virtuous or vicious cycles. We usually see what are called development clusters. A country will be rich, democratic, and stable, or poor, authoritarian, and conflict prone. If all good or bad things go together, how do we figure out which one actually came first? 
How do we manage when regime type and economics might both be a cause and an effect in a country at the same time? I don't have the definitive answer to this question, but we can start tackling it by being clearer about what we mean by a cause. In social science, we tend to use a formal definition of causality developed by the psychologists William Shadish, Thomas Cook, and Donald Campbell. According to this definition, there are three things you need to have to call something a cause. First, correlation. You need your cause to be related to your effect. When your potential cause changes, your effect should change at the same time. This is called correlation. Correlation alone does not mean that one thing causes another. But if the two variables are unrelated, they don't move together. It's, you're definitely not seeing a cause. The second thing is temporal precedence. Your cause needs to happen before your effect. As with correlation, this is fairly obvious, but it's not always easy to show when we're talking about things like democracy and development, where sometimes change is very slow. Finally, we need to eliminate alternate explanations. This is the most important of these three criteria, and the hardest one to demonstrate. Let me give you a few examples to illustrate this. The most famous example of how correlation is not causation is the fact that ice cream sales are correlated with shark attacks. But people eating more ice cream does not actually cause them to be eaten by sharks, even if you can create a story in your head where that makes sense. There is an alternate explanation that makes more sense. A third factor, in this case hot weather, can explain both why people are eating more ice cream and why they are more likely to be attacked by a shark, since they're more likely to be at the beach. Here we have two variables that are related, so that is one criteria, but we don't see one clearly happening before the other, and we can't rule out an alternate explanation, so it's not a cause. To come back to democracy and development then, if we wanted to show that a rising middle class leads to democratization, we would need to demonstrate that the cause isn't a more educated population, or labor protests. This is really hard because it can be difficult to separate variables like education from economic power, or to come up with a complete list of all possible explanations for why one country might become democratic. So in political science, we actually often don't prove causality, but rule out alternatives. But each time we do examine this question and either rule something out or demonstrate that it's plausible, we do get closer to the truth. I want to touch briefly on the final two parts of this formal definition. These aren't requirements, but they are nice to have. Manipulation means running an experiment. The easiest way to think of this is a clinical trial for a vaccine. We can conclude a treatment is or is not effective by randomizing who receives it during a test period. We'll talk later about how we actually can do this in political science and public policy, but you can't do it for all political questions, which is why this is nice to have, but it's not necessary. Last, it is also helpful to be able to describe a causal mechanism, a process by which a cause leads to an effect. This is actually something that we often are able to do in political science. We can describe the history of a country, for example but it's not a formal requirement because it's actually often miss missing in other fields, like medicine. We knew that aspirin reduced headaches long before we understood the precise biology of how it worked. So those are nice to have, but the key parts of demonstrating causality are showing that the cause and effect change together, that the cause comes before the effect, and that nothing else can explain the relationship. I want to end with a brief discussion of some of the adjectives you might see associated with the word cause in our readings. I've already discussed contributing causes, but we also talk a lot about proximate and distal causes. A proximate cause is a short-term cause. Protests lead to the resignation of a leader, for example. A distal cause is a long-term one. For example, that changes in the structure of economy create the conditions for democratization. Both proximate and distal causes can be true, but you should be clear about which one you're interested in. Finally, in politics we almost never study deterministic relationships. That means that when one thing, a cause, happens, an effect 
always happens. There are always exceptions in politics, so we almost never see the kind of definitive relationships that we study in physics or chemistry. Instead, we study what conditions make an effect more or less likely, what might change the probability of an outcome. Sometimes we can identify what are called necessary conditions. These are conditions that have to take place for an effect to happen, but don't guarantee that it will. There are very few cases of transitions to democracy that don't involve some kind of protest, for example. So we could say that protest is a necessary cause of democratization. But just because there are protests doesn't mean that a country will become more democratic. It is not a sufficient cause. So that's a lot of vocabulary on causality, but just to recap, the key things I want you to remember from this lecture are, first, be clear about whether you're talking about defining terms, cause and effect, or something else. Separate factual, causal, and normative questions. Second, be clear about what you think is a cause versus an effect. Do you think that democracy is a cause or development is? Third, the key factor in talking about causality in political science is eliminating alternate explanations. And finally, in politics, we need to think probabilistically. We need to think about what conditions make an outcome more or less likely.